Well, I'm joined by Dr. Bill Conley, the Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for Mercury Systems, a defense electronics company headquartered in the United States. Now, Mercury Systems is a supplier of a variety of electronic systems for aerospace and defense companies, but one that many are not familiar with. So, Dr. Conley, welcome to the program. Can you give us a quick description of the diverse products that Mercury produces? Yep. Thanks, Alan, for uh, for having me on today and the opportunity to talk a little bit. As you mentioned, uh, Mercury is a provider of kind of computing systems and a variety of different platforms across the aerospace and defense market. Our products range from advanced microelectronics to digital processing, largely used for radar electronic warfare, C4ISR applications, as well as the mission computing used for avionics and displays, for example. Wow. So it's a pretty diverse portfolio. Um, as CTO, I, I presume you're constantly watching the trends that around this market. Just give us an idea. What are a few of the trends that you see occurring currently? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a lot of my role is really watching the trends for what's happening. The first one that I think is really important is how commercial technology is currently coming into the aerospace and defense market, very different than how things used to be. And so it's more of a transition in as opposed to a transition out from the defense ecosystem. And the second one is really around autonomy, safety, and trust, and how those future systems are going to be able to go ahead and operate in the ways that we really desire and want in the future. So they're both critically important topics, but at the center of the discussion for this virtual air show that we're on now, could you expand on your comments around the commercial microelectronics. Yeah, yeah. So I think that one's really a good one to start with because the commercial microelectronics really feeds a lot of what is happening with the autonomy, the safety, and the trust piece. And so I see if you go back and historically look at this during the 1960s, kind of the heyday of the Cold War, the federal investment in R&D in the United States was about double the entirety of the commercial sector. And with that in mind, it really meant that the government side and the aerospace and defense side was really leading in terms of technology. If you compare that through the 1980s, it kind of reached parity. And where we're at today, the entirety of the commercial economy is spending about 2.7 times more money than the entirety of the federal government. In no way, shape, or form is that to discredit what the federal government is doing. They've been kind of keeping pace with inflation. But what it really shows is the growth of the commercial sector and a wide variety of innovative advances that are occurring on that side. So, Bill, can you give us a couple of specific examples? Yeah, there's there's one in particular I want to talk about, and it's particularly related to the, the so-called 2.5D integration of silicon, uh, which is also known as kind of shiplet technology. And so when you look at what has happened in commercial silicon, the challenges there associated with getting bigger wafers, bigger dyes, and smaller transistors, and every couple of years there's kind of this discussion around Moore's Law, and if we're reaching the end, the so-called end of Moore's Law, Moore's Law, just to remind everybody, is the doubling of transistors every 18 months that continues to increase computing power each time. By going to chiplets, what that really enables us to do is to design smaller chiplets, integrate them inside of a single package to allow a quicker design time, a lower cost, and a better yield, all of which ultimately result in more value for the end customer, the user of that capability. Now, you're going to be doing a webinar on that, I think, uh, as part of this uh, Farnborough Connect? When, when do we get to find out uh, a bit more? Yep. Yeah, that, that's correct. So we are doing a webinar uh, later this week. I encourage everyone to check the schedule for the specific time. And so specifically, I'm going to be talking with Tom Smelker, who is our general manager and vice president for that business, and really talking about his leadership role in this space. Okay. Now, you talked about microelectronics as being the key enabler for safe and secure operation of autonomous platforms in the future. I mean, that's something that worries a, a, a lot of people, and I'd like to really explore that in a bit more depth. Can you can you tell us about the trends you see in this? Yeah, order? yeah. So I'm I'm glad to expand in this area as well. There's there's obviously a ton of excitement in concepts like urban air mobility. I mean, as as humans, we've really spent the vast majority of our entire history kind of living on the surface of the earth. But if you look over the last century, that ability to fully utilize three dimensional airspace to go ahead and deal with congestion, go ahead and deal with the desire to move things over longer distances very quickly. Um, and so when you look kind of underneath the hood of that, we traditionally have used humans to kind of be the controller side. But if you look at what's happened in computing, 
Um, you know, for example, look at Deep Blue with chess. Look at Watson, its ability to play Jeopardy. Look at things like AlphaGo and the ability to work on a problem that actually has made humans now a better player in terms of what they were able to go ahead and program. Um, for where we are in each of those applications, the computer is now actually capable of doing better in a digital way than a human can actually go ahead and do. I think we're kind of at a tipping point in that exact same way for where we are kind of broadly with this autonomous concept in terms of vehicles and urban air mobility. Um, but in that is a lot of other things. How do we bring in the safe? How do we have trust in that? And how do we realize that vision is going to be a really exciting future as I look at that trend? Now, I know I saw somewhere you were once saying that the one of the problems was the shortage of pilots, for example, which is why we need, need autonomy. Now, we, we haven't got a shortage of pilots anymore at the moment. Do you think there is a still going to be a role for the human in this? And do you think that the autonomy is going to happen with public confidence? Right. So so there's a, there's a variety of words that are very easy to say in this sense, but I think it's really going to turn into kind of a blended solution when this is all said and done. Um, and so in that, I think it really comes down to how do we think about safety? How do we think about trust? And how do we think about security? Um, and so broadly, when we think about wanting to make a system safe, that tends to mean that we really are designing a completely open system. We want third-party verification of how something is going to work, an open code repository that everyone can go ahead and look at. In comparison, if we juxtapose that with security, most of the time when we really talk about designing in security, what we're talking about there is having as black of a box as possible having as few humans really understand what is happening inside of that system. If we raise that up a little bit, though, um, I, I think that there's kind of a bigger discussion around trust and how do we, the human, either as a passenger or as an operator in conjunction, how do we manage that risk? What is the context of that mission becomes particularly critical as we look into the future. Correctly. I mean, that's that's great, but I'm not sure it's all good news for us to to uh, realize that desired future. I mean, do you see us on a path to achieve urban air mobility, or how can we reconcile that tension? The human right. Experience? So right. So my my short answer is yes, and I actually think it's a little bit of a change in terms of the design processes that we go about using to go ahead and execute this. Um, traditionally, the safety community has kind of come around one pillar of how to think about design. Security has come around a different one. And I think it's going to be how do we blend those design environments? How do we blend that ability to go ahead and have a third party review along with the ability to protect particularly essential elements of how a system goes about working? Um, in that is really a lot of context for that particular mission, which is blended. There may be, you know, kind of purely civilian urban air mobility type of examples where we want that more autonomous behavior. There at the same time may be very defense centric ones where security is a higher priority. And so how do we blend that knowledge? How do we leverage technology back and forth? Ultimately, though, what I think we really are after as humans is we want trust that the system is going to do what we expect when we expect it to and behave in a predictable way. And so how do we go ahead and test to ensure that we're getting the trust and the confidence in that system is going to be different than kind of the traditional way of doing a test where everything is distributed around the Gaussian mean and you expect things to behave in a statistical fashion. What we're now talking about is more so does something behave in a predictable fashion that I as a human am comfortable with. And so how do we begin to kind of evolve our engineering thinking and how do we design better systems into the future, I think is how we're going to get there. But we're, we're designing them now, aren't we? I mean, we, we know they're being tested in China. We know they're being used in the Middle East. Um, the confidence that you have with flying one over your head, how do you test it to give confidence right. to the public without flying it over their heads? Right. So so in that, I think, is, is kind of the divide between developmental testing, where you want the ability to repeat the exact same test and have confidence you're going to get the same answer, versus operational testing where you're looking for that mission level performance. Um, and so over time, as we build up more flight hours, we build up more confidence in that system. I think that then allows us to progressively do, you know, to your point, more over people's heads. Um, and I think, you know, if we look at kind of the last two decades is how the drone conversation, and not, not talking about military drones, but talking about kind of the hobbyist class quadcopter drones, the confidence in the autopilot features 
in the variety of signal processing that is either running on the platform or in the controller box that a human is using to kind of you know loosely modify how the system is behaving. Um, it behaves in a very intuitive fashion that gives a human a lot of confidence and therefore trust in terms of how it is operating. I view this as kind of a continuum of going from something at kind of the kilogram class progressively into something bigger. Um, but I think it's a very logical continuum for how we approach this. Thanks, Bill. That's very insightful. How do we find out a bit more about this? Yeah. So, so in our case, um, Amala Wilson, who is our senior vice president and general manager, who leads all of our businesses focused around mission computing, avionics, displays. Um, you actually can catch her piece at the Thursday Daily Wrap Up, which is a great opportunity to go ahead and explore more in this area. Fantastic. Well, it's been fascinating talking to you. And thank you for telling us so much about a very in-depth subject. Thank you. Mm-hmm.